and we're live. So hi everyone. I haven't seen you guys for two weeks, and um, I mentioned the previous time that you know I will be seeing you on the eighth of November. I hope you guys save that date and you are joining us today. Once again, we're gonna wait for fifteen people to join the stream before we officially begin. What you should do now is to please share this with your friends and family because I feel that it would benefit them and I feel you think it would benefit them as well. We need to know about our lungs and more importantly, how to keep it healthy. So we have 15 people on the stream already. I'm very happy to see all of you. Happy Sunday. Welcome to Talking Life with Macy, everyone. I'm so happy to see you. I haven't seen all of you in two weeks. Thank you so much for all of your wishes on my birthday, for sending me surprises, and more importantly, just spending time to text me. I really, really appreciate it, all of your private messages. Thank you so much. So today on Talking Live with Macy will be the first episode of a three-part lung cancer series. This is in conjunction with Lung Cancer Awareness Month this November. I think many of you are probably wondering, why are we talking about lung cancer? Well, the thing is, lung cancer is one of the most common cancers here in Malaysia. Did you know that? Well, for me, I didn't know that until I researched more about it. And the, all of us always think, always think about lung cancer as people who smoke, they get lung cancer. So we don't need to care about it. But that's not true. So it's time for us to deep dive and find out more about how to keep our lungs healthy and more about lung cancer. So I'm going to quote a little bit of statistics from the Journal of Thoracic Oncology. This is from Raja Durai and Company. Lung cancer, as I've mentioned, is one of the most common cancers here in Malaysia. And nearly 90% of lung cancer patients in Malaysia are diagnosed at stage 3 and 4, which means they, they come at the later stages. And most common cause of cancer-related deaths with a five-year observed survival rate is only at a mere 9%. That's the survival rate of lung cancer patients here in Malaysia. So we have the president of the Malaysian Oncological Society and a practicing clinical oncologist at Prince Cop Medical Center here with us today. I would like to encourage all of you to start asking your questions, put in your comments at, and your questions at a comment section so we can pick it up. Previous two sessions with Dr. Hajikor and Dr. Dr. Yunus, all of you put the, your questions at the end and it's very hard for me to pick it up for the doctors. So please start asking your questions now. And um, I would like to introduce once again, the president of the Malaysian Oncological Society and a practicing clinical oncologist at Prince Cot Medical Center. We have Dr. Azrif, who specializes in clinical oncology from the UK. Hi, Dr. Azrif. Hello. Hello, thank you for inviting me to participate. And before I forget, happy belated birthday to you. <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Azrif. More importantly, thank you for taking time to join us here today and to raise awareness of lung cancer and our lung health. So I'm going to jump straight into the questions for you. Dr. Azrif, could you share with us a little bit more on your specialization in oncology and why you pursued a career in oncology specifically? Okay, uh, so I'm a clinical oncologist. So that means that I deal only with cancer patients and what we call solid tumors. So that means breast cancer, lung cancer, colon cancer, etc. The hematologists deal with le le leukemias and lymphomas. So I've been a, uh, I completed my training in 2006 and then returned to Malaysia in 2007. So I've been a, a specialist in this field for 13 years now. Right. Oh. Um, sorry. So the second part of the question was, was why did I choose oncology? Okay. Yes. Uh, so I um, I was in UK at the time, um, and this was around the 2000s. So I graduated from medical school in the UK. I was a Petronas scholar, you see. So. Um, after finishing medical school, I had the option of staying on. So I worked and completed my uh, internal medicine training. So then was looking around. So once you finish internal medicine training, you kind of have to decide what, what kind of specialist you want to be, what kind of specialty, medical specialty you want to go into. 
Um, I, uh, oncology at that time um, it wasn't really that well taught in medical school. We only had like one or two weeks in oncology. And doing, in, doing internal medicine, you would meet a lot of cancer patients who come in with their symptoms, um, and lung cancer patients, breathlessness, cough and things. So we would, the internal medicine team would often investigate these patients, come to a diagnosis, and then we would in, then refer the patients to the oncologist. So the, the oncologists at the hospitals where I was working at, they were not um, resident oncologists, so they were visiting, you see? So they had this like aura around them. You know, ooh, it's like someone coming from another hospital, we have to get everything ready. Otherwise so they'll be very upset with all the scans and biopsy reports are not ready, so they'll, they'll stride onto the, uh, onto the wards to see the patients. And then, then they, would, they would kind of like um, reveal the treatment plan Okay, um, uh, and then the patients would then be transferred over to the cancer hospital for their chemotherapy or their radiotherapy. So there was always this like mystery, as it were, behind uh, behind what the oncologists used to do. So then I think sparked my interest. I wanted to know what was behind that mystery. What 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 were they doing? So uh, I applied for an oncology kind of like a training um, oncology position. Uh, as a junior doctor, I uh, found that I quite liked the kind of approach. Uh, you could see the, the consultants, they had quite a good rapport with their patients. They knew the patients very well, the families as well, um, at a very difficult time, very challenging time for the patients. Um, at that time, the treatment that we had for cancer was quite limited. The chemotherapy drugs we had was quite limited. Um, but things were developing. That, that was the start of when you had a lot of these like new targeted treatments available for oncology. So the science behind that, that learning about physics uh, in, 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 uh, in radiotherapy, radiotherapy treatments and things, and then the molecular biology behind cancer. So that uh, was very interesting. So. Uh, I kind of like delve deeper and then got my training position. Um, and then here I am now. There. Okay. So that's a long story. All right. I'm glad that you started. Uh, I'm glad that sparked your interest in clinical oncology. So you've been practicing for quite a while now. There have been many myths out there about lung cancer, such as if you're a smoker, you would get lung cancer. Is that true? The, the, the link has been established for I think 40 years, 50 years. Um, so from the 1950s, 1960s, group from Oxford uh, established that those who smoke have a much higher risk of developing lung cancer uh, compared to those who do not smoke. Um, so this is not something new. We have known this for decades, really. Um, but the tobacco companies, the, the, the thing is with, with lung cancer is when you start smoking, you don't develop the cancer until maybe 10, 20 years from the time that you start smoking, you see. So when people first started smoking, it's a very, uh, very cool thing to do. Um, you have a lot of peer pressure uh, to smoke, but you don't see the effects of cigarette smoking until you're in your 40s or your 50s. So that is why uh, it was difficult uh, at the beginning to establish the link for smoking. Uh, and I, I think the tobacco companies have to take some blame for this because they did challenge the initial results. Yep. So that is why there's still this myth that uh, lung cancer is not caused by smoking. But what what about those people who do not have who do not smoke? Why are they getting lung cancer? Okay, so uh, there's about 1.7 million uh, lung cancer uh, deaths per year worldwide, um, and I would say 
Uh, world, if you look at it worldwide, about 90% of lung cancers are due to cigarette smoking. Now, in Malaysia, we do have a category, a group of patients who are never smokers, who do develop lung cancer. And uh, not just in Malaysia, but um, in East, yeah, basically in this part of Asia, so China, all the way from China, Korea, Japan, all the way down to Indonesia. Um, and this is because um, you could say the never the people who do not smoke uh, in this part of the world have a genetic susceptibility to the carcinogens, the cancer-causing chemicals in the cigarettes, and this uh, makes them more susceptible to developing lung cancer. Um, and this is because um, commonly this is what we call uh, EGFR mutation. Uh, it's about 40-50% incidence in Asia, whereas it's only about 5% in the West. You see. So the majority of never smokers in this part of the world uh, have mutations within the uh, cancer. And this is driving the growth of the cancer. I see. So, I mean, you would say that um, when it comes to people who are never smokers and they have lung cancer, is is it because they smell secondary smoke? Yes, so they have, you can think of it as the environment uh, within their lungs, the genetic environment is very susceptible to factors within the external, within the external environment. So it could be air pollution, secondhand smoke, etc. And this because they are breathing this in daily, right? Uh, and this kind of like triggers the development of lung cancer in the never smokers. I see. Okay. Um, that's interesting actually to know. So what are the symptoms of lung cancer? So commonly, usually it starts with a cough. Uh, usually a dry cough, a uh, persistent cough. Uh, that lasts longer than a normal cough that you would associate it with a virus or bacteria. Um, and usually, uh, this cough uh, sometimes can produce a phlegm, often they do not. And, they might, and then this cough can progress over a few weeks or months to difficulty breathing, breathlessness. Um, uh, they do not normally present with coughing up blood. If this is a this symptom is actually quite rare. Usually, cough, difficulty breathing, uh, and then they present to the hospital and X-ray. Usually, the or family doctor. Uh, usually, then an X-ray will be done, and then the X-ray will show an abnormality uh, in the within the lungs itself. Um, and then, further investigations then show that this individual has lung cancer. I see. So it always starts with a cough, but when they have cough, is it early stage or late stage already? Uh, yes. So this is a problem. Um, our lungs are quite large and the tumors can, and when they start, they can be quite small, one to mm. two centimeters or so. When they're this size, usually uh, the patient doesn't have any symptoms. So a lot of the early lung cancers, uh, patients are what we call asymptomatic. So do not exhibit any symptoms at all. So when they do develop the cough or difficulty breathing, that's usually then uh, patients present at stage three or stage four. The times when, they, when we kind of discover that there's stage one, it is usually this cancer is discovered at what we call incidentally. So maybe they come in for a particular problem. Uh, we do an X-ray or a scan. Okay, and then find, oh, there's something in the lung. Then investigations and confirm that it's been lung cancer. So would you say that there is no such thing as early detection for lung cancer? I mean, uh, because no. everybody wants to know. Yes, okay, uh, not true. Okay, there is uh, early detection. Um, so far, there have been few studies that have Establish the role of doing a simple, what we call simple CT scan, a low dose CT scan uh, in heavy in smokers basically, uh, because they have a higher chance of developing lung cancer. So smokers above the age of 45, 50 or so, 
I advise to go for annual or uh, basically an annual CT scan. Okay, uh, this CT the purpose of this CT scan is to identify nodules or uh, tumors within the lung when they are at an early stage. So the studies show that in patients who undergo this kind of screening for lung cancer, uh, then they do have uh, a better chance of identifying the cancer at an earlier stage and therefore achieving a better chance of cure. Okay. But what about those people who smoke, let's say, from 20 to 25 or 20 to 30 and they stop? Then what are their chances of lung cancer? Will it still, is the chances still high? Uh, so obviously the first thing is to not to smoke okay? <laughs> uh, and encourage the people around you not to smoke. Uh, that can be difficult okay? uh, because per, here I have a teenage son, so I understand uh, how difficult uh, trying to cope with peer pressure is. The, um, sorry, what was the question again? The question is, if let's say a person smokes from 20 to 25, oh, right. 20 yes, yes, yes. 30, okay. will okay. lung cancer okay. present itself still in the future? Okay. So if they, like I mentioned, if they smoke from 20 to 25, it's not like they will develop lung cancer immediately. It takes 20 to 30 years from the time that they start smoking to, to develop lung cancer. Okay? So let's say you smoke um, for five years or so, light smoker for five years, and then you stop. We do know, studies do show then that your risk of developing lung cancer will reduce. Okay, So it never reduces to that of someone who has never smoked. But obviously, you can reduce your risk of developing lung cancer. Because studies have shown that the amount of smoking you do is correlated with your risk of developing lung cancer. So the number of cigarettes you smoke a day, how many years you smoke. Okay. Uh, the, so what, what we call uh, the number of pack years. So now this is defined as uh, one pack year is someone smokes 20 cigarettes a day for one full year, one pack year. So the more pack years you have, the higher the risk of developing lung cancer. Okay. I see. So if okay. you do smoke, then the advice is stop uh, immediately Okay, or try the, as best you can to stop smoking because then this will lower your risk of developing lung cancer. Okay, so you're minimizing your exposure to the cancer-causing chemicals in the cigarette smoke. I, I'm sure tobacco companies are definitely not happy listening to this. <laughs> so... Yeah, sure. um, so how does one improve their lung health? Is there any um, exercises or what would you advise? Uh, the number, uh, the, the, my top three would be don't smoke, stop smoking, reduce the number of cigarettes you smoke. <laughs> right? So the, that's the main thing. So whatever you do uh, to improve your lung health, if you smoke, is, is going to have marginal benefit. So I would say to get the biggest bang for your buck, really, to get the most benefit, you have to stop smoking. Uh, and then after that, basically live a, a healthy lifestyle, uh, exercise regularly, uh, eat well, make sure you sleep well. Uh, so get enough sleep, seven to eight hours, because what you're trying to do is you're trying to improve your overall general health okay? um, and prevent uh, prevent the development of other diseases, for example, heart disease, hypertension, obesity, that kind of thing, which uh, can, to a certain extent, affect your chances of developing lung cancer. They are kind of like minor factors, okay? Uh, but, the, so you have to deal with the main factor first, which is the cigarette smoking, and then healthy lifestyle, to ensure that you minimize your risk of developing lung cancer as, to as low as possible. Okay, so stay healthy guys, keep fit and eat well. Um, and through your career, have you met many lung cancer patients? Uh, unfortunately, yes. yes. Oh, okay. Unfortunately, it, because it is a common cancer. It is one of the top five cancers in, uh, in nature, right? Uh, I think it's number two among men, 
and top five among women in Malaysia itself and worldwide it is uh, top three. So That's top so three, easy, right? Yeah, top three is basically breast, lung, and colorectal bowel cancer. That's top three. Okay. So any any oncologist right. will be seeing many cases of lung cancer. And the funny thing is, we don't talk about our lungs enough, or we don't even talk about lung cancer. So what is the survival rate for lung cancer patients that you you yourself have seen? Uh, again, it is very much determined by the stage uh, of the cancer. Uh, so obviously, as you mentioned earlier, the majority of lung cancers are stage uh, 3 and 4. So they do present at a more advanced stage. So at these stages, the chance of being cured is lower. Uh, however, there have been, since I've been practicing, uh, even since I returned to Malaysia, uh, over the last 13 years or so, there have been uh, quite remarkable, quite significant advances in lung cancer. When I first started in lung cancer, we would treat all stage 4 lung cancers with chemotherapy. But now, uh, I'm in the middle of my career now, now we have chemotherapy, we have targeted therapy, and then we have immunotherapy as well. So being able to have access to these treatments can actually significantly improve your chances of being, of, of being alive for a significant period of time, even with the disease. Thank right. you so much um, yeah. talk, for sharing so, more about the various treatments. Yeah. So the stages, obviously, um, is diff um, the I don't keep I don't keep a running uh, tally of how long my patients survive for. It's a bit morbid. Uh, yeah. um, the the most lung most of the lung cancers I see in Malaysia, to be honest, uh, they, are, they they tend to be never smokers. So a lot of my lung cancers are never smokers. Okay, so uh, they have about a fifty percent chance of having a mutation within the lung cancer within their cancer. So often then we can treat them quite effectively with targeted therapy. And then they can lead a normal life, basically going to work. Uh, and then uh, targeted therapies can often control the disease very well. So I have patients who have been like three, four years on targeted therapy and doing, doing remarkably well. You wouldn't know when you see them on the street that they, are, that they have stage four lung cancer. Yeah. That's, I mean, so, technology is amazing. Yeah. The, the, the advancement in lung cancer, every year now, there's something new, right? Either we're combining uh, one treatment with another to improve the outcomes. Uh, yeah. So that's one of the interesting things about oncology, really. There's always something new uh, to learn at every uh, oncology meeting. There's some new advance, some new discovery. That's what makes it exciting. It gets more, it gets more exciting every year. So for all of you watching, stay tuned. Like I said, this is the first episode of a three-part series. The next two weeks, we're going to really, really focus on immunotherapy and targeted therapy. We're going to talk extensively about what it is and how it's used. And of course, um, survival rates based on those treatments. So please join us in the next two weeks as well. So I, that's all for my questions, Dr. Azrif, thank you so much for answering them. No now we're going to take questions from all of you. So start asking your questions now. Um, so William asks, like, what is the... Um, he asked whether the quality of doctors and treatment in Malaysia, is it the same as Singapore and UK? Well, I can safely say yes. <laughs> but Dr. Azrif, if you want to answer that question, you can. Um, the, okay, so the majority of oncologists working in Malaysia, uh, I would say, yeah, the majority of us were trained in the UK. Yeah. Uh, so we will come back with our uh, UK qualifications. Um, some were trained in Singapore. Okay, so we have a small handful who were trained in Singapore, a uh, few in Taiwan. Um, and then uh, the next uh, largest group after those who were trained in the UK were those trained locally in, in Malaysia. We've been run, we have our kind of like uh, master's training program in oncology since 2000 and 
four or five, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and we produce about anything from five to ten new specialists a year. Um, and we to ensure that the standards uh, are high, we have uh, examiners coming. So examiners coming from the UK and Singapore as well to come and uh, kind of like externally examine our candidates to make sure that they are on par internationally. That was yes, and then we go to the same meetings, the uh, medication, everything is all available here as well. So I would say they're, they're similar to, to, to those overseas. Thanks, thanks, Dr. Azrif. So Kevin Tan here uh, mentioned that you, his mom uh, was your patient at Prince Court a few years ago before she passed on. I don't know whether you know him. <laughs> um, but yeah, I guess he's saying hi. And um, so Audrey Herrera asks, she is a breast cancer survivor. And last week she was diagnosed with primary lung cancer. I'm so sorry to hear that, Audrey. Uh, she says early stage, she's a non-smoker. So what would your advice be to her? Surgery? That's what she's asking. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Primary breast cancer survivor. Okay, this one, right? And last week, the early stages, I'm a non-smoker. What would you advise? So early, so early, so obviously when, when we come, when we talk about cancer, we define it either early stage or advanced stage. So advanced stage is usually a stage three, stage four. So firstly, I would like to establish when she says early stage, does she mean uh, stage one? Okay, stage one, early stage two kind of thing. Um, so from her profile picture, she looks quite young. So uh, if she is, if it is truly an early stage, then I would advise to go for surgery first. Okay. Uh, Primarily because now I'm not to say primary diagnosed with primary lung cancer it means that they probably did a biopsy to confirm that it was a lung cancer and not a metastasis from the breast cancer. Uh, yeah, so I would advise to go for surgery first. In kind of the borderline cases, okay, so the what we call the early stage three cancers, sometimes we do get chemotherapy before the surgery to kind of the results of the surgery but if if, if i i'll take i'll take uh, information she's given her early stage one and two then you will usually have to go for surgery first yep. that okay. that will give her thanks. the best chance of cure thanks dr azrif so chang yen asks what about vaping is it equally damaging or worse than smoking uh controversial uh there isn't as much data behind vaping as it is for lung cancer. Like I mentioned earlier, all the data we have for lung cancer initially, uh, people started smoking really after the First World War, okay? Um, and then it increased further during the Second World War. So we only started to see the rise, more and more patients developing lung cancer in the 50s and 60s. So it takes about 20 to 30 years. And this is for something that we know is highly carcinogenic cigarette smoke. So if something that is highly carcinogenic takes 20 years to cause lung cancer, anything that is less so, obviously it'd be a bit more difficult to establish the risk. Uh, we do, I mean, there was that case, there, there was that kind of uh, number of cases for a year or two ago in America where young men who were vaping had a very unusual, very severe disease of the lungs. Uh, and we were not quite sure what was causing this? Uh, basically, young men were presenting with severe breathlessness, and basically, uh, holes were appearing in their lungs okay? because something was damaging the lungs. So we couldn't really identify. So it's probably some kind of chemical within the within that vaping content itself. Um, there are pros and cons. I know even within the our community, there are some who do say. Uh, it's the lesser of the two evils, okay? So if someone smokes, a cigarette smoker, they, if they need something to kind of bridge to stopping smoking, then vaping may be a useful medium that I wouldn't just stop at vaping, okay? I will use it as a stepping stone. Uh, if you do not vape, would I recommend vaping? <laughs> Obviously, no. 
And is it equally damaged? So his question is, is it equally damaging? I would say short-term data, uh, I would say no. I cannot say long-term, okay? Uh, because the jury is still out, the long-term data. The thing is, uh, obviously with vaping, you have the short-term benefit, short-term pleasure, but it's a long-term long -term consequences of the action. I see, okay. So thanks a lot for answering that. Uh, I guess just don't vape, don't smoke. Don't smoke, don't vape. <laughs> yeah. um, so Eric has a friend who's a heavy smoker for 30 plus years and he didn't get lung cancer, lah, but he had cologne cancer last June. But now he's suspected, suspected of having lung cancer from a few tests recently and diet was really bad. So Eric is asking whether you have any real life patient experiences similar to that case, I'm guessing. Uh, yes, so if he had colon cancer last June, um, and then the yeah, addict says that suspected they also have lung cancer, um, it is probably most likely that what he has is what we call lung metastases, okay, or lung secondaries. So the primary is the colon. So the cells originate from the colon, but then they spread they spread to the lungs. So this can quite commonly happen. So the timing as well, diagnosed with colon cancer last June, and then now having uh, changes in the lungs, uh, it, is, it is equally likely that it could be lung metastasis from this colon cancer. Um, like, I, like I mentioned, uh, diet was really bad. Uh, usually, I have to say, my experience with uh, cancer patients they, when they are diagnosed with cancers, they tend to go, yeah. the pendulum <laughs> swings right over to the other side. They become vegetarian or like only uh, they cut down sugar and everything, right? Uh, so it's not that common that I see uh, cancer patients continuing with their unhealthy lifestyle. Uh, if they don't do it, then they'll be pestered by their relatives, family members to change their lifestyle. So that, that, that's quite uh, surprising that he wasn't able to change his diet. Uh, yeah, so real life patient experience, I'd be very suspicious that his friend is actually having lung metastasis from the colon cancer, to be honest. Um, sure. if, if, the, if the colon cancer has been removed and there's no disease elsewhere and just small nodules in the lungs, there, there is a there are some some of these patients they can the their lung metastases are can be like slow growing okay so it's a bit difficult to advise to give proper advice without actually knowing the full detail of the patient but some yeah some of these patients can kind of like the lung metastases grow slowly uh, over a year or two before they need treatment okay thanks a lot Dr. Azrif, so um, William asked whether we have any subspecialties here for oncology in Malaysia. Subspecialties. Uh, so there are, so we, within oncol field of oncology, obviously we have hematology. So they deal with uh, blood cancers, lymphomas and leukemias. And then there is clinical oncology. So this is usually those who were trained in the UK, uh, they were trained to give, to give chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Uh, but if you if you were trained in US or Europe, then you have medical oncology. So these are really just oncologists who just give chemotherapy. And then you have radiation oncologists. So oncologists were just trained to give radiation. Okay? So basically, you have four subspecialties under oncology. And then if you if you work in a center that is large enough, then you you and so then you may decide to just focus on a small handful of cancers. Okay, so maybe one major cancer, for example, breast cancer, and then one or two minor cancers, for I example, see. cancer of the bone or muscle, maybe gynecological cancers, right? Um, so uh, so in in this way, then um, you basically you're more efficient in handling the workload. I see. So, so you kind of sub-specialize in the kind of cancer that you treat. So this happens more commonly overseas, 
the UK, US, where they live, work in huge centers and one cancer center might have 40, 50 oncologists. So then you would kind of like uh, divide up the work among itself. So you have like a lung cancer team or breast cancer team. Okay. In Thank in Malaysia, in, in Malaysia, because we don't we don't have that critical it's mass as yet. Yeah. Yes, and also there are ethnic di differences. So like a Malay patient may want to see a Malay doctor, or a Chinese patient may feel more comfortable with a Chinese doctor kind of thing. So it's a bit difficult to kind of divide it up that way. Really. So it's basically more uh, generalized uh, oncology for Malaysian doctors, right? Okay, so no Atika asks, uh, she has a brother, her brother is having dry cough every day for two years. And x-ray and blood tests done was showed normal results. It, does she need to do anything? She asked for advice. Anything else? Okay, so x-ray and blood test. So uh, a cough for every day for two years and the x-ray was normal. So I would say that uh unlikely then when when the symptom is going on for this long uh, without a worsening of the cough okay so she doesn't mention whether he's breathless or having chest pain as well which will be other symptoms of lung cancer and to be honest you you wouldn't have early stage lung cancer for for two years it's kind of yeah too long okay usually within about a few months or so with the cough they're already presenting at the hospital so she doesn't mention how old her brother is. Uh, doesn't mention whether her brother smokes as well. So sometimes um, the patients may have what we call reflux. Okay, so the gas uh, acid acid from the stomach refluxes up to the back of the throat, irritates the throat, so they cannot have a ticklish cough kind mm -hmm. of thing, right? So. Uh, that might be, that's usually treated by a gastroenterologist that just gives some medication to settle the stomach down and then things improve. If the brother is a young, then I would kind of suspect asthma, okay? Uh, because as, asthma can often present with a cough. Uh, um, allergies as well. Patients with allergies can present with a dry cough. Uh, I would advise them to in this sort of situation then to take her brother to a lung physician a lung specialist respiratory uh, so lung specialist basically for further investigations then the lung specialist will be able to determine are we dealing with asthma or something else or the reflux and things okay so that that would be my advice but i have to say based on the information is given i would say it's unlikely that we're dealing with but obviously a bit suspicious <laughs> okay i hope that answered your question no Atika. so crystal ku says uh she wanted to ask what can they do to relieve a stage four lung cancer patient while waiting for results to determine the exact subtype is it she said it is a two-week wait so what to yes. do to relieve the symptoms uh, what can we do to relieve the symptoms? Okay, so usually then, um, if we are if we're waiting for the results to determine the subtype, probably the patient has seen. Uh, so usually to, the the biopsies are done by the lung specialist. Okay, so they do the bronchoscopy, get the tissue. Patient may not have been to see the oncologist yet. So I think what I would then do is to try to expedite the appointment with the oncologist. Okay. Uh, obviously, the more the more cons the kind of like symptoms to be of particular concern would be pain or difficulty breathing. Okay. Because in lung cancers, often fluid can accumulate in the lung. So if patient is getting more and more breathless, having difficulty moving from a chair to the bathroom, kind of thing. Uh, it has to stop after uh, walking just a few few steps or so. Then it could it be, it be very suspicious that it's actually fluid building up in the lungs. So then what we need to do then is just insert a tube into the chest to drain out the fluid. Then this would rapidly improve the breathlessness. If the pain is, if, if the symptom is pain, you know, obviously making sure a patient is getting adequate pain relief. Okay, so painkillers to... 
uh, help to control the pain. Um, and if it is more, if, if it's kind of like the anxiety waiting for the results, and I think just being positive, uh, giving encouragement to the patient. If the patient is still smoking, encouraging the patient to stop smoking. Uh, one thing that I advise my lung cancer patients uh, before they, uh, if they have to undergo chemotherapy, is I do advise them to see the dentist. You know, often they're a bit surprised, but this is often because uh, once you start chemotherapy, if you start to have dental problems, uh, dentists usually will not want to deal with your problem if, if you're on chemotherapy. They're very wary because chemotherapy can increase the risk of infections and things if you have your teeth removed. Uh, so to see the dentist, get any fillings done or extractions done beforehand. Uh, yeah, and try to expedite the appointment with your colleagues. All right. Okay, hope that answered your question and I hope um, the person is relieved will get better. Um, Stella Moon says, what is your advice for her who coughs easily throughout the years and she has gone for a thorough checkup but nothing is wrong? Uh, she took so six months worth of medication to read the latent TB, which was advised by the specialist. Uh, okay, so um, latent TB. Okay, so obviously if she's seen a specialist and the specialist recommended medication for TB, uh, he probably has a high index of suspicion that she was struggling, uh, that she probably had TB. So she didn't say when she finished the six months medication though, uh, whether it was just recently or quite a while ago. Uh, if it was yeah. recent, now often if you're taking medication for TB, uh, <laughs> usually the symptoms in after the first month or two okay so if it hasn't improved after taking six months then probably it's probably not to be uh, allergies can often trigger the cough especially uh, that's true consistent cough uh, so might need to go for an allergen test i assume she's seen the specialist she's done the she's done the full work and lung cancer was excluded so other thing would be underlying asthma uh, like I said, reflux as well, uh, esophageal or gastroesophageal reflux disease. I also think and it could be good. Could be good. Yeah. Okay. So that can be treated with, uh, easily treated with medication really. Uh, allergies, that's the other thing that can cause a cough. Yeah. All right. She says it has been a few years already, so I'm guessing it could be either good, as you mentioned, or yeah. allergies. Allergies, yeah. Asthma is the other one. Some some patients can have underlying mm -hmm. asthma, and the only presented only presentation is a cough, really, um, worsened by cold weather, exertion, kind of thing. So it might need to have investigations to rule out those things. Yeah. Okay, so we'll take two more questions, guys. Sorry, because uh, I don't want to take up too much of Doctor Azrif's time. So uh, our um, for Joanne's question, she asked, will sleeping in a room with air ionizer help reduce chances of getting lung cancer? <laughs> uh, I think no, no data to support that. So I think I have to answer that with a no. Uh, I don't think it will reduce uh, the chances, uh, but it may help to reduce the allergens, okay? uh, uh, pollutants, etc. in the air that might irritate the lungs and cause a cough. Uh, I don't think it will reduce the chance of anything like cancer. Okay. And Serene Fong asks, she, her mom has, her, her friend's mom has stage 1 lung cancer. She has done the surgery okay. and it, the next two years she had breast cancer after that. So she, she asks, is, is it a lung met metastasis or is it a different type of cancer? A, or getting two uh, types of different cancer? Okay. Uh, so stage 1 lung cancer, okay, so I assume that there's no relapse, no recurrence of the lung cancer and then now after two years, breast cancer, okay. Uh, so lung cancers, it is extremely rare for lung cancers to spread to the breast, extremely rare. Uh, it's usually the other way around, it's quite common for breast cancers to spread to the lung but extremely rare for lung cancers to spread to the breast. 
I've only seen maybe one or two in my 20 years, so I wouldn't put that at the top of my list. So I think this is most likely, we're most likely dealing with a second primary, so another kind of cancer. Okay. So I think her friend's mom has breast cancer. Okay. It is very unfortunate, uh, but it can happen. Okay. Uh, uh, there are patients who have one cancer and then a few years later develop another cancer. Uh, yeah. okay. Hopefully, right. the breast cancer was detected at an early stage. I hope, I hope she's okay. getting the right treatment. So, Dr. Asri, one more question. So, William's dad has put state cancer stage 4 and it became bone metastasis. So, is there a possibility of full recovery? Sorry, this one. Uh, prostate cancer stage 4, bone metastasis. Is it? William yeah. Tugandi. Tungadi. Yeah, he's from Indonesia. All right, okay. Uh, sembuh. Apakah bisa sembuh total? Um, depends on how you define sembuh or cure. Right, uh, you can definitely so patients with stage four prost prostate cancer. To be honest, the disease can be controlled quite well with anti hormone medication, just injections once every three or six months or so. Uh, patients who usually do not need to undergo chemotherapy, uh, so we can control the disease very well so that the patients would not even feel that they have cancer, right. Uh, I suppose you could call that sambo. Sambo means that there's no evidence of the disease at all and the patient is not on any treatment. So we can definitely, we, with treatment, we can uh, we can make the patient what we call cancer-free. Okay, so so in, 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 in our work, we basically, we, we try to uh, achieve a, a disease-free state. So that means no evidence of cancer on blood tests or scans. Uh, and then the patient often continues on treatment with the anti-hormone medication and stuff. Okay. Uh, to be cured, basically, you need to go for a period of several years. And usually, the benchmark is five years of uh, being cancer-free. So, uh, no evidence of cancer on follow-up investigations and usually uh, not on treatment either. So, uh, our definition of cure is a bit more strict. Uh, but control and render, rendering the patient disease-free is definitely possible. Okay. Very good chance. Thanks a lot. Um, okay, Dr. Azrif, I know you have to go. I'll just ask one last question. Uh, is lung biopsy recommended to confirm cancer? If not, what else besides tumor markers? And is lung biopsy painful? Uh, lung biopsy... So, uh, this is obviously we're dealing with lung cancer here because... That's, uh, that's our topic, lung cancer. Yes, uh, for any kind of cancer, because cancer is what we call, cancer is a pathological diagnosis. We cannot diagnose cancer based on a blood test, unlike, for example, diabetes or high cholesterol. Those blood tests are a lot more specific. Okay, you just do a blood, you go for fasting blood sugar. If your blood sugar is above a certain level, then you're diabetic, you stop. Okay. Uh, Cancers, we, we, deal, we are dealing with like 200 different kinds of cancers uh, and it's a pathological diagnosis. So even like a lump in the breast, uh, nine times out of ten, it's not cancer. It's just a benign, uh, what we call a lipoma or fibroadenoma or a cyst. Uh, same things with nodules in the lungs as well. Uh, most of the time, in screening, the majority of these abnormalities we see on lung cancer screening actually are not cancer. So to be able to dis, uh, determine whether someone has cancer or not, we do need to do a biopsy. It's very important. We cannot diagnose cancer based on blood tests alone. So if you see anyone, doctor or non-doctor outside who's trying to convince you to do a blood test uh, to diagnose cancer, do not believe them. Run away. Okay, He's trying to scam you of your money. Okay. Enough scams already. Okay, uh, I get enough calls from Bank Nagara telling or LHDN saying that I owe them taxes. But it's not true. Uh, so if you you cannot diagnose cancer based on a blood test, you have to do a biopsy. So uh, biopsy for lung cancer is not painful. It's usually what we call a bronchoscopy. Usually, so the patient is sedated. We put a scope through the nose, down into the airway, take a little pinch of the tumor, send it off to the lab. Okay. 
And then, so during this whole procedure, the patient is asleep basically, and then they wake up without feeling any pain at all. Uh, so it's not usually painful. Uh, okay. Thanks a lot, Dr. Azrif. Thank you so much yeah, for your welcome. questions yeah. from Thank everyone as well. Yeah. Um, guys, this is the first part. There's two more weeks of lung cancer series. Uh, next week, we have Professor Dr. Toh Lai Man. He will be talking about targeted therapy. And you're going to find out so much more about it. And the following week, we're going to talk about immunotherapy. So if you know anyone who has lung cancer or would like to find out more, please ask them to join us, all right? Um, share this with someone um, who will benefit from it. So get to know your lungs and, um, and more about lung cancer. Thank you so much, guys, for your questions. And, and once again, thank you, Dr. Azri from Prince Cup Medical Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you. Have a good evening, everyone. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.